Hello, my name is Joshua Maximilian Eichler Summers. I'm studying for a master's in psychology of mental health, and I'd like to suggest a new interpretation of dreams, which is the theory of maladaptive belief awareness. And a maladaptive belief is a repetitive, normally anxious feeling, which does not match with reality. And I'll give you a little example of one. So let's say that there was a big button that you could push, and in your mind, you felt very scared that something bad would happen if you pushed the button. So you felt tense at the thought of pushing the button. But actually, if you push the button, a puppy appeared and that puppy made you happy. So the, the fear that you felt around pushing the button would be considered to be a maladaptive belief, uh, an anxious feeling which does not match with reality uh, because you don't actually have to be worried about pushing this button because you're going to get a puppy and it would be more adaptive for you not to have that anxious feeling so you could just push the button again and again and again and surround yourself with puppies. So maladaptive beliefs are feeling errors. So I'm saying that the this new interpretation of the dreams makes us aware of the feeling errors that we have inside of ourselves. So right now, the the dream theory is in a bit of an uncomfortable state. On the one hand, we have psychology where the scientific approach is being used, which means that all the theories you're able to validate, you can make a hypothesis and then do an experiment and find out if you're accurate or you're not accurate. And through this method, some really useful and important things have been discovered, like what stage of sleep the dreams take place at, what areas of the brain are active or inactive, uh, what are the different levels of neurotransmitters, what's the different type of frequency of, of dream content. But right now, the actual content of dreams is viewed to, to lack personal meaning, which feels a little bit uncomfortable because the content in dreams is very personal and so are the narratives and we can remember dreams so it's strange that this personal narrative doesn't seem to, to have any meaning. In psychotherapy uh, dreams are full with meaning um, and often the, op the interpretation is open-ended so you ask what does this strange thing or event in the dream mean to you so for example if you saw a three-legged white dog it could be your grandma with white hair who has a walking stick. Um, but there's an issue here with this method that is that it fails uh, from a scientific method point of view, which means it's not possible to make a prediction and then validate if you're true or not. We'll never know if that three-legged dog was your grandma or was not your grandma. Uh, so there's a kind of uncomfortable um, situation at the moment. So to understand dreams, we're going to have to understand some other things first. In the same way that if we were going to understand a river, we'd have to understand what land was, what water was, and what gravity was. To understand dreams, we're going to have to look at how the mind works while it's awake, what the different functions of the different brain areas are, and how maladaptive beliefs are removed. This is a two-part video. Uh, this is the first part. We're going to cover what dreams are and how to interpret them. Um, predicting dream content using this method of interpretation and how uh, this method of interpretation kind of goes on in our brain, what's the neurology behind it. Uh, the next dream, sorry, the next video we're going to look at why we need to dream um, and uh, PTSD dreams and how dream content changes while doing therapeutic work with dreams using this method of interpretation. And if you want to, for, to, to get an update when I release that video, please just send me an email at that address. So we're going to start by looking at how we respond to emotional situations when we are awake. Which might sound like a silly place to start as we're looking at dreams, but it's actually a very good place to start. And this is William Domhoff, who, though he looks a bit like Dr. Evil, uh, he's actually the kind of king of the dream world when you're looking at it from a scientific point of view. He's the distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, and he wrote very recently a book called The Emergence of Dreaming, which brings together all of the latest evidence when it comes to dreams. And he says there's a strong connection between um, dreaming and waking cognition that has been demonstrated by the neuropsychological and developmental evidence and there's no need to study Freud and Jung because of their emphasis on dreaming being so different from waking thought. So, so that he's saying that what's going on in our minds when we sleep is very similar to what's going on when we're awake so we don't have to look at things so differently. This is from another paper, The Neurophysiology of Dreaming. Um, perhaps the most striking feature of conscious experiences in sleep is how altogether similar the inner world of dreams is to the real world of wakefulness. 
So when we're awake, we can observe someone in a situation taking a behavior and get an idea of their maladaptive belief in the same way that we could, if we knew that that button gave you puppies and didn't cause explosions, we know that that guy who was really stressed out about pushing it had a maladaptive belief going on, a feeling error going on. And we can observe these in extreme situations. Um, and these are so people who have who are having a, a very tough time from a mental health point of view. So if you observe someone at the dinner table uh, and they're very, very thin, looking quite unhealthy, and they're not eating, you might have an idea that they have body image dysmorphia. Or perhaps in a more kind of friendly, uh, more kind of layman term, perhaps they feel terrible unless they're perfect, and in their mind the consumption of food makes them imperfect. Or you could look at someone who's meant to be hanging out with their friends, but they're really tense and they're not, they're not able to socialise. So perhaps they have social anxiety, or in their own mind, perhaps they don't want to upset anyone. And for some reason, they feel that anything they do might upset people, so they stay very, very quiet and still. And we can observe these also in, in milder situations. So for example, if you're at a restaurant and someone gets served cold food, and that person doesn't complain, you might have an idea that they have conflict anxiety or they feel that being rude is awful and complaining is, is going to be rude. Or you could look at someone who has a very small conflict with their partner, but they have a huge angry reaction to it. Uh, and perhaps they have overly aggressive reactions, or they feel they won't be loved unless they make a fuss, so they've always, they always seem to overreact to things. They can't, just, they, can't, they can't have small reactions to things. So when it comes to maladaptive beliefs, we have a kind of pyramid going on in the world where we have people with extreme feelings and symptoms, so things like depression, social anxiety, eating disorders, OCD, paranoia, uh, and people who have mild uh, feeling errors and symptoms, so things like conflict anxiety, light social anxiety, intimacy avoidance, imposter syndrome, hiding creativity, being easily irritated or self-sabotaging. And the ones that are extreme tend to be very easy to observe or much easier because the symptoms become much bigger themselves too, and, and the ones that are subtle uh, are, are less easy to observe. And if you have an extreme one, you're probably diagnosed with a mental health problem and hopefully you receive some treatment. And if you're in the mild category, you're probably considered fine, you might consider yourself to be fine, maybe a little bit frustrated sometimes with repeated patterns in your life that you don't like, but you typically would go untreated. But from a maladaptive belief point of view, they're all the same structure as there, they're feeling errors, some are more extreme, but both of them are feeling errors which don't make too much sense. So these maladaptive beliefs are very common. Maladaptive beliefs also tend to have structures which relate to your caregiving environment where, that you were in when you grew up. So if you were very lucky to be in a healthy caregiving environment, and that meant that your parents didn't overreact to any of your behaviours, and they also were very stable characters, and, um, and they didn't neglect you in any way, they, they gave you a good level of attention, then you won't have too many anxieties um, you'll you'll be sort of feeling that if you get upset that's okay if you're happy that's okay if you want some time alone that's okay you don't have to worry about uh, how other people are going to react to you because they reacted in a really healthy way but a lot of people don't grow up in those situations so you can have an overreactive caregiver so perhaps every time you get angry they get furious or perhaps every time you get emotional they get angry so you feel from a young age that you can't do those behaviors because you want to keep your environment as stable as possible. Uh, you might have neglectful caregivers who don't pay enough attention to you and the only time that they, they do is if you get angry with them or you hurt yourself or uh, you play the fool or whatever. And you also might have some caregivers who are unstable, so maybe someone who when they get sad, uh, they get drunk and then very angry. Um, so you're really trying to, you're on tenterhooks hooks to stop them from getting sad and upset. So you're trying to control their mood. So, like I said, it's possible to get a, an awareness of someone's maladaptive belief through observing their behavior in a situation. So why am I talking about this? Why is awareness of maladaptive beliefs useful? So when it comes to therapy, um, the, the kind of aim of therapy is for the, someone external who's the therapist to become aware of your maladaptive belief and then to pass that awareness onto you, the patient. So if someone external is aware, then the person with the maladaptive belief can be made aware of their own, their own kind of feeling error that's present. And this awareness is the key to the maladaptive beliefs removal.
So to understand how this happens, we're going to have to look at, at um, and, and how therapy does help with this, we're going to look at what happens in the mind uh, when you're actually experiencing a maladaptive belief in a situation. And these maladaptive beliefs are typically anxious, you typically fear something's going to happen, so it's actually the neurology of a fearful emotional reaction that we're looking at. So obviously you hear something and you see something, so these parts of your brains activate, so that's if you're, uh, if you're in a situation, you're obviously going to hear and see what's going on, assuming you're not blind or deaf. Um, then uh, the, the first bit of your brain that triggers, which is kind of exciting from an emotional point of view, is what's the context that's going on here? And this, brain, this bit of the brain isn't actually that bit that's highlighted, it's just on the surface, so but the brain's cut in half so you can't see it properly. Then there's a bit of your brain which triggers, which asks what's the historical or stored context of what's going on. Then a bit of your brain asks, will this impact me? Is this situation to do with me? And if it is, and it's a dangerous situation which, which you have a maladaptive belief about, you're going to get scared that something bad's going to happen here. And these two areas of the brain talk to each other. Then that area of your brain to do with memory, the creating or finding memories um, is pop up. The, uh, the relay system of the brain, which kind of connects lots of different brain areas together, also activates. Uh, your, intention, your attention increases too. And uh, your body gets ready for movement, so your kind of body gears up to move. So there's intense emotional activity that takes place when you're experiencing a maladaptive belief that's triggered by this part of the brain asking, what is the context of what's going on? So how does therapy fix this? So this is from a book called Why Therapy Works, which looks at uh, the kind of neuroscience behind therapy. And the author writes that therapy gives clients the skills to reality test their maladaptive beliefs, behaviors, and emotions. And test is the key word in this, in this, uh, in this sentence. So we're going to test the maladaptive beliefs. So when you're normally experiencing a maladaptive belief, we tend to take maladaptive behavior, which tends to be very, very safe behavior that is, feels immediately safe, uh, but perhaps in the long run isn't very useful to reduce the stress. So we're in a situation with a maladaptive belief and we take maladaptive behavior to reduce the stress. So again, let's imagine that we're at the dinner table with body image dysmorphia and, or a feeling that we must be perfect and the food that we're putting into us is going to make us very imperfect. We're going to be feeling very stressed and a great way to reduce the stress and what our uh, our, our mind is calling for is to not eat. That's really going to calm us down because then we're then we're going to maintain our perfection. Or if you're sort of served cold food in a restaurant and you have conflict avoidance and you really don't want to be rude, then you're going to be feeling a little bit stressed. Like should I say something? Should I not? And a great way to calm yourself down is to not complain. And obviously that's not very useful if you'd like hot food. So to test a maladaptive belief, we try. And do an adaptive behavior which tends to be a little bit more risky um, but it's probably going to lead to a better outcome because our fears the, the fears that we're feeling aren't very logical that's a feeling error that's triggering and we're going to see what happens so we're not going to do what we did before we're not going to take the maladaptive behavior to reduce the stress instead to test the maladaptive belief we're going to try an adaptive behavior a slightly more risky behavior and we're going to see what happens where we where we correct to be so scared of the situation so again we're in the situation with a maladaptive belief our emotions are firing and then because we're now aware because we have this awareness of our maladaptive belief and this is why i've been focusing on on awareness uh, we're we're going to this awareness that the therapist is able to, to pass on and this is why it's so important we're going to pause and say hey i'm doing what i always do in this situation uh, i always feel a little bit scared here but I don't know if I really should be scared in the situation. So instead of doing what we've always done and carrying on with our maladaptive behavior to immediately reduce the stress, we're actually going to try a different behavior. We're going to pause, be aware of what's going on, that this is what always happens, and try something new. And this is going to be really stressful because we've been avoiding this, uh, and that's why we've been scared. So the, the emotional activity is going to become, going to go up. It's like it's going to be very, very scary. And then we're going to see what happens and see were we okay and typically we are okay when that happens and what happens in the brain when you when you do this is that that area the trigger uh, that asks what is the the context it begins to have a reduced response to situations that were stressful before um, and so you can see that the brain calms down so we, we see the reaction the stressful reaction begins to reduce um, when you observe that hey I, I did that scary thing and actually 
I was fine in that situation. And it might be the case that you don't just do it once and then you never feel stressed again. You have to repeat this process of being aware, pausing, trying an adaptive behavior and observing that, if you, that you're okay. And the emotional reaction that you'll, that you'll have to it will reduce over time. It might be like jumping off of a big diving board where you, uh, where you were scared the first few times um, and, and then eventually you just love throwing yourself off it. So when it comes to the situations that we've been looking at, where you've had body image dysmorphia and a feeling where you have to be perfect, you could say, hey, I, I, I know that I have this fear here and today I'm going to eat and I'm going to be imperfect. Um, obviously, that we wouldn't view that typically as an as a imperfection, but for that person, the, this is going to this is going to be really scary, imperfect situation, and they're going to see can I survive this imperfection? And they will, and people might stop stressing around them, and things might become to be okay. And if they repeat that, the stress will will reduce over time. Or if you're in a restaurant, serve cold food, and you're having the conflict avoidance reaction, and you really don't want to be rude. You can say, "Hey, I'm going to complain, and I'm going to be rude today," even though most people might not think that you were you were really being rude, but for you, it might feel like rude. And maybe you get the meal taken on off the bill, or they cook it again, and you realize, "Hey, things were okay, and no one freaked out around around me." So, just a quick recap on maladaptive beliefs: they're feeling errors which take place when triggered by certain situations, and, and they're normally stressful. So, so they kind of light up the emotional parts of the brain. Um, you can get an idea of a maladaptive belief by observing someone taking behavior in a situation, and they're common. There are these big mental health issues, but the maladaptive beliefs are, are fairly present in the, in lots of people who, who are kind of perhaps struggling to reach their potential or just coming up against the issues in their life. And awareness is key to their removal. When you have the, the idea that you have a maladaptive belief in your head, when you're next in a situation experiencing a maladaptive belief, you can be aware and, and pause and then take an adaptive behavior and see what happens and if things are okay, which they typically will be, and you repeat that process, the stress reaction that you had previously in that situation will begin to fade over time. That's why the awareness is so important. So we've seen that there's intense emotional activity going on in the brain when you're awake experiencing a maladaptive belief, but these aren't the only areas of the brain that activate. So these are the emotional functions of the brain, but your brain also has executive functions, and executive functions are are the areas of your brain which are responsible for your cognition and your thinking. So when you're planning uh, things in your mind or kind of focusing something on something really on a concrete way uh, or talking to yourself um, to, to kind of think through a plan, these are this, this is the parts of your brain which are triggering the executive functions. And these are also active when you're in a situation experiencing a maladaptive belief. So we have an area of the brain which is responsible for introspection and planning and new thought processes processes and new behaviors. We have an area for directed attention that lights up too. We have uh, an area for kind of emotional distance from a situation which lights up. So that's like if you were going to take a step back and think about things in a more logical way, that area is, is the area that's, that's responsible for that. And we have an area that is related to self-reflection that also lights up too. So you can think, which is really good for you in the situation where you're experiencing the maladaptive belief because you can kind of plan your way out of it. But it's not very good for your therapist if your therapist's main aim is to become aware of your maladaptive uh, belief. So it would be great for your therapist just to observe your emotional behavior only. So then he could easily get an idea of your maladaptive belief because you couldn't hide it using your thinking. And then pass that maladaptive belief onto you so you can become aware and begin the process. But that isn't what's going on. What's happening is that you're doing calculated behavior when you are awake because you're using your emotional functions and your executive functions, which means it's much harder to get an idea of the maladaptive belief. So the therapist or the observer might have a hard time uh, understanding that you have a maladaptive belief there because you can conceal it. So therefore, you can't be made aware of it. So calculated behavior makes it hard to, for us to become aware of the maladaptive belief. And just looking at a few of the examples, we'll be able to see why. So let's say... Uh, you have conflict anxiety and again you're served cold food at a restaurant you can do things like pretend the food is nice so you can feel like you could complain but you don't want to tell everyone oh I'm scared to, I'm scared to complain um, they're going to hate me because you might be scared of admitting that too 
So you go, mmm, this is lovely, when actually you don't feel that on the inside. Um, or you say, it's fine, I really don't mind, I like, I like cold lasagna, or whatever. Or if you're at the dinner table and you have body image dysmorphia, you could hide food. Uh, so you might know that people react badly to you not eating. Um, so instead you just slowly hide the food away, because even though you know it's not a very healthy behavior, you, uh, you still feel compelled to do it, but, so you don't want to alert anyone, so you can hide that you have this condition. Or you can make a lie and say, um, I ate earlier, I'm already full. So calculated behaviors hinder the discovery of maladaptive beliefs. So there are other problems as well with, with learning about a maladaptive belief in the real world. So we've seen that there's calculated instead of emotional action going on, which, which means it's hard for us to get an idea of what the maladaptive belief is. It's also very disruptive to the person who's experiencing the maladaptive belief and society. So the person who's experiencing the maladaptive belief will have maladaptive outcomes. They're going to have bad outcomes. Um, and uh, the that means that they are... Um, going to have, you know, if you're not eating when you need to eat, things aren't going to work out well for you. Or if you're not complaining when you could complain uh, rightfully, then you probably won't have the same standard of living as someone who's more comfortable complaining. And these disruptive behaviors also interrupt kind of the productivity of the group. Now, I know we live in cities today and it's quite easy to be an individual and you can go to the supermarket to buy your food, but that wasn't always the case. Things used to be much more Tense the productivity of the group, the tribe, was very important. Um, and if you have people acting in very strange ways, um, it's a really it's annoying for the tribe. So it would be great if, if it didn't actually have to happen in real life. Um, and the situations can be subtle. So obviously, we've seen that when you have a mental health issue, issue things can become obvious. Uh, but if, if you haven't got such a severe maladaptive belief, it can be a bit unclear and therefore be untreated, such as in the situation with the cold food where it's very easy to, to tell a lie and get out of it to say it's fine or whatever. So if we were to create an ideal world where we'd learn about maladaptive beliefs, we would have it so that people could only take emotional behavior, so that they couldn't take any calculated behavior. We could just observe uh, how they were emotionally only and we could therefore get a very clear idea of what their emotional maladaptive beliefs were, because the maladaptive beliefs are emotional. And um, and the behavior would be imaginary instead of real, so it wouldn't be disruptive to the group um, or for the person. There wouldn't be any real-world maladaptive outcomes, and the productivity of, of the group would be uninterrupted. Um, and situations would be exaggerated, which would mean that it would be clear not only for the people with the obvious maladaptive beliefs, but for everyone else too. So imagine you were at a restaurant and someone was served a dead rat on their plate. Uh, if that person didn't complain about it and pretended they liked eating a dead rat, I think it'd be pretty clear to everyone that that person had an issue telling the waiter that something had gone wrong. And it's my view and, and my experience working with Dream so far that this situation of observing emotional behavior only, uh, only um, uh, which is imaginary in exaggerated situations, is exactly what a dream is. So that the purpose of a dream is for us, the observer, either the person who is having the dream to realize it themselves or through discussing the dream with someone else for that person to become aware of a maladaptive belief present within them through observing their own behavior which is emotional only in an exaggerated situation so obviously we know that the dreams take place when we are asleep um, and not when we are awake so we know that the behavior is imaginary instead of real it isn't happening in the real world it's just happening in your mind it happens to be the case that during REM sleep, which where is where you get the most vivid uh, kind of complex dreams, which you most typically will like be the ones that you share with someone else, only the emotional bit of your brain is working. So when you're awake, you're taking calculated behavior because the emotional functions of your brain are on and the executive functions are on. But when you're in REM sleep, um, you're only the emotional brain's only the emotional parts of your brain, brain is on and the activity in them, in them is increased and the executive functions are silent. So you're taking only emotional behavior in your dreams. It's a great place for us to observe just emotional behavior. Uh, if you're a lucid dreamer, then the executive functions in your mind are actually on when you dream. But for most people, when they're not lucid dreamers, 
and uh, it's you're just the emotional functions are running and dreams are famous for being weird and one of the the kind of the ideas of this theory is that this weirdness when we start looking at people's behavior in response to this weirdness um means that the situations are very exaggerated and uh, we're going to see in some examples now uh, how these exaggerated situations make it very clear that the person is taking a maladaptive behavior and therefore has a maladaptive belief belief present in their emotional mind so if dreams are about observing maladaptive beliefs through looking at emotional behavior in an exaggerated situation we need to interpret them in a new way so dreams tend to have a very typical structure so there's something normally some extreme things are happening so there's maybe an extreme event an extreme object or an extreme person or situation happening might be a few of those things combining to make something super extreme and then there's the dreamer's feelings and behavior and right now in the old method of interpretation we make the assumption that the dreamer's feelings and behaviors are fine uh, and very often when people tell you what their dreams are they don't even tell you how they felt or how they behaved they just tell you what happened to them so right now we look at all the weird stuff that happened and we ask what does this stuff mean and as we've said at the beginning when we do this the scientific method doesn't work because we can never prove or disprove that these weird things meant something so in the new method of interpretation the the um the structures are obviously the same but instead of assuming that the dreamers feelings and behavior are fine we're going to assume that they're not or, or we're going to really look at their feelings and behavior with respect to all this weird stuff going on and we're going to say that all the weird stuff going on let's just assume that that was actually happening to you in real life so let's not question it let's just say if i was actually in this situation how would i feel and how would i behave so our attention is going on this area on the dreamers feelings and behavior that's what we're going to be examining and we're going to be asking ourselves is it maladaptive does it look like that person didn't do something that was obvious or they did something that was really unusual that didn't match the situation or for some reason they felt compelled uh, to not allow something to happen to someone when really it was um, a, a kind of needless uh, feeling there uh, or was their behavior adaptive were they doing what kind of seemed obvious uh, so if if they were called to be angry in the dream were they just angry which would be someone who's had low anxiety who didn't fear the expression of anger so we're going to look and see does the behavior which kind of box does it fit into and we're going to find that it consistently is maladaptive the behavior so it's, it's you're doing people are doing very strange behaviors and we're going to look at the gap and this gap between what the extreme situation seems to so obviously call for and and the odd behavior which is which is maladaptive is going to give us an idea to that a maladaptive belief which we're 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 learning is present in the dreamers emotions because we're observing just their emotional behavior only and now we're going to see some examples and uh, get a sense of how this works in practice so example one so victoria this is victoria's dream and victoria is in a room with a homeless man he is dirty and he smells foul he tells her that he is sad and he would like her to come uh, to accompany him to bed because of this in the room is a double bed but not a normal double bed in the bed uh, in the, the bed in victoria's words is a health and safety hazard it is dangerous it is a dangerous contraption with springs shooting out of it and it is clear that it may jolt severely at any time causing anyone on it to fly into the air and receive injury the proposition does not appeal to victoria but she feels she must help victoria gets into bed with the man she feels extremely uncomfortable in the bed victoria wakes up so we're just going to break the dream down into the structures that we discussed previously uh, so there's a situation going on which is a dirty homeless man asks Victoria to get into a dangerous bed because he is sad and there's Victoria's emotional response which are feelings of reluctance and obligation and uh, there's Victoria's behavioral response which is uh, uh, to get into the dangerous bed with the dirty man so let's ask ourselves let's imagine that we are in the uh, the the situation that Victoria is in in the dream we're in uh, there's, a, there's a dirty homeless man and there's a dangerous uh, bed uh, and, and that homeless man asks us would we like to come to this dangerous bed to get into a bed with him and I know how I'd feel and I think uh, I'd feel reluctant and I think my behavioral response would be to say no and <laughs> um, I don't think I need to 
to get into bed with this homeless man. I'd say, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to get into bed with you. Um, so it's quite interesting that the situation, you probably couldn't create a situation which, which asks for a no more clearly than a dirty person asking you to get into a dangerous bed. Um, so I'm saying that the adaptive response kind of matches what I think most of us will agree the situation calls for. And it's very interesting that Victoria is unable to say no. And so we're seeing that the injuring response is the is the maladaptive response, and the and it's not the adaptive response. There's a difference here, and it looks like that could be perhaps she can't allow other people to be upset, or she feels like she can't express no to someone. And whereas if she felt that she'd be fine expressing any type of reaction, then she'd just go with her feeling of reluctance and say, "I'm sorry, I don't want to get into into bed with you." And we can see that this difference. Uh, this gap between these two responses begins to show us what some potential maladaptive beliefs are. So Victoria feels an obligation where none is required. That's one of the differences. So perhaps a maladaptive belief that Victoria has is that she feels she must put the solving of other people's problems above her own well-being. Um, another difference is Victoria gets into bed when saying no is acceptable. So perhaps a maladaptive belief that Victoria has is that she feels uncomfortable defining reasonable personal boundaries. So we're getting quite a clear idea that the that the maladaptive belief is no, and we've seen that this maladaptive belief is, is visible through observing her emotional behavior only in a, clearly a very exaggerated situation. And we've discussed before about how to remove maladaptive beliefs, uh, to go from her being uncomfortable saying no to being more comfortable saying no, and that this is... This is what uh, the writer here was talking about, to test, we have a test this maladaptive belief. So when Victoria is next in a situation where she feels herself doing what she doesn't really want to do, she can, she can say, hey, I always do this. She's gotten this awareness from the dream that she, maybe she says no, not often enough, and she needs to start saying no more. And she can try an adaptive behavior, which is saying no, when she doesn't want to do something, and see what happens. And things will probably be okay for her and her emotional and her, her mental reaction to that situation will start to cool down, especially if she repeats this process again and again. So here's another example. Uh, this is Curtly's dream. Curtly is in a shopping mall. A young child comes up to Curtly and demands his wallet and phone. Curtly hands over the wallet and phone. The young child stands near Curtly with Curtly's belongings in front of him, accessible to Curtly should he decide to take them back. Curtly wakes up. So. Again, we're going to break the dream up into the structures. So there's a situation going on, which is a child demands Curtly's belongings. Curtly hands them over. He stands near Curtly with the belongings on show. And there's the in-dream response, uh, which are feelings of frustration and loss. So I discussed this dream with Curtly, which is why uh, that information wasn't on the previous slide, but that's what it is. And he hands over the belongings and, um, and is standing there and doing nothing. So... If I imagine I was in that situation, I think I'd also feel frustration loss, and I'd probably feel a bit of anger as well, uh, because if a kid a kid has no right to steal my possessions, um, and uh, from a behavioural response, I think I'd probably say no to the kid because it's a kid um, trying to rob my possessions. And if I did give my possessions to a kid and he stood there right in front of me with them visible and with me able to take them back, I think I would try and take them back. So again, we're seeing a situation which is. I think very clearly calling for a kind of ex expression of personal defense um, and in fact the, uh, I, so I think the adaptive response matches this to kind of to, ex to defend myself but Kirtley is, is not defending himself in this situation. So we can see there's a difference between the adaptive response and the in-dream response which is maladaptive in this case. And it looks a little bit like this that he must never express uh, this kind of anger or aggression, even when it's clearly justified, because someone's stealing your possessions, you're, it's not it's not their right to steal your things. And again, we're seeing these this differences highlights a maladaptive belief. So um, it's showing us that one of the differences is the lack of feelings of anger actually in Curtly's response. So maybe Curtly believes that things bad things will happen to him if he feels angry or expresses anger. That could be a potential maladaptive belief. Another difference is. Um, he does not. He does not refuse to hand the items over or take the items back from a child. So Kirtley is not comfortable defining reasonable personal boundaries. So that could be another maladaptive belief present. And again, we know what 
Curly can do to help repair this. If he finds himself in a situation where he feels a kind of personal defense rising, which he's he might feel it there, but he's not expressing it, he can become aware and again use that awareness which he just got from the dream and try the expression of a little bit of personal defense and see what happens. How does the world respond to that? And see if things are okay and they they probably will be uh, and uh, and there therefore the the emotional response will will dampen. Here's another example. This is Adam's dream. Adam knows he has an STD, uh, which he doesn't have in real life, he just has in the dream only. And then he gets a blowjob from a girl who then vomits. Adam knows uh, that he has to drive to pick someone up, but he gets drunk and he crashes the car mildly on the way. Adam wakes up. So again, we're breaking the dream down. So Adam knows things will go wrong with his actions, but he does them anyway. He spreads the STD and he gets drunk when he needs to be sober. Uh, and the emotional response that he has is kind of an ignoring of the feelings of responsibility and, and he feels that he must live it up. And I, again, I asked him that separately. Um, and the behavioral response, he gets a blowjob uh, with an STD and he drinks before he drives. So if you knew you had an STD and you also knew you had to go and pick someone up, uh, you you probably feel some level of responsibility and, and, and have feelings of self-control that you probably wouldn't want to spread your STD around. Uh, and you wouldn't want to get drunk before you drive. So you probably take sensible actions like not getting a blowjob and not driving and uh, and drinking. So the situation is kind of calling for him to be a little bit cautious. Uh, so I think the adaptive response would be a cautious response. But he's taking actions which cause sabotage to himself and the world around him. Um, so... Again, we're seeing a difference between the adaptive response and the in-dream response. And it looks a little bit like someone who's taking weird actions that they that really they don't need to do to kind of almost cause chaos around themselves. Um, so perhaps he feels he must cause this chaos, otherwise he, uh, he will be neglected. <coughs> um, so again, we're seeing this difference, um, these differences between the two types of actions and the potential maladaptive beliefs which they could result in. So he's knowingly taking self-destructive actions, and uh, the maladaptive belief could be that Adam feels the need to take self-destructive actions. Um, there's also another difference where he ignores the feelings of responsibility and feels an obligation to always live it up, and that these, these feelings, this idea that he always feels he has to live it up, encourage Adam to take self-destructive actions. So he's kind of, by feeling like he always has to have a good time he actually might be damaging himself, and uh, which might call attention to himself. Um, and again, we know how to, to to repair this maladaptive belief. So Adam can be aware and uh, and pause, um, which again, this awareness he's gotten from the dream, try an adaptive behavior, which would be to be a bit more sensible. So, so don't do the maladaptive behavior of living it up and self-sabotaging and observe that things are actually okay and people are still... Uh, relating to him normally and they haven't left him or neglected him so things are okay and again the emotional behavior will will the emotional response will reduce from this so dreams are really famous for being extreme um, everyone talks about strange dreams that they have and we've seen some strange situations in this dream we've seen a dirty homeless man in a dangerous bed we've seen a child stealing and standing still and we've had someone with STD have sex um, and someone uh, who needs to go driving get drunk before they do it and i'm positing that dreams are extreme because it makes the maladaptive behaviors more obvious that and this is a theoretical conclusion from from this this theory so you probably couldn't create a situation uh, that calls for a no more than a dirty homeless man in a dangerous bed um, if someone steals from you and then stands still it's a it's a really great situation to express some anger and if you have an STD or you need to go driving, uh, it's a really bad time to to have any kind of intercourse with someone, and uh, and it's a really bad time to drink. So it's kind of calling for you to act a bit sensibly. But we see that our dreamers act in really odd ways, given what the situation so obviously demands. So we have Victoria saying no, uh, not saying no when she when it really looks like she should. We see Curtly not expressing anger, where. It looks like um, anger is really deserved. And we see someone taking very self-sabotaging actions. 
when the situation really calls for them to be a little bit more responsible. So we're seeing this big gap between between these two um, these two obviously called for behaviors and the maladaptive behaviors which our dreamers are taking. And I'm saying that this is why uh, dreams are so weird. Uh, they're weird because when we start to accept all the weird stuff that's going on, it means that the behavior um, that we're looking at, the maladaptive behaviors, become even more obvious. So it's possible to to use this method of interpretation to make predictions too. So as we talked about in the old method where you just look at the extreme event, the object or the, the person in the dream and you ask what do these things mean, that it's impossible to, to ever really verify the predictions that you can make or the, you can't even make predictions. It's very impossible to verify the interpretations. But in, in when we're looking at this, this uh, new interpretation of dreams, where we think that dreamers are typically taking maladaptive behaviors in their dreams, given what's going on, if we just accept what's going on. If people tell us only what's going on in the dream and they don't describe their feelings or their behaviors, we can ask ourselves what would be a very adaptive behavior and therefore what would be, an, what would be a maladaptive behavior. And we can make a prediction about their behaviors in the dream. So we can predict what would some maladaptive um, feelings or behaviors be and see if we're right or if we're wrong. And I found that using this method, that prediction has been successful when it comes to the behaviors of people um, and the feelings that they have within their dream. So example four, um, prediction. Um, Andrew has been doing some artistic uh, painting at a class. He has his easel set up, he has his paints out, a cloth on the floor, and he has found a spot with the right lighting. Andrew comes back to the situation expecting to find it how he left it. However, all his stuff has been moved to the side and the class has moved the table into the room and are having lunch. Andrew wakes up. So we've heard the situation, what happened to Andrew. So Andrew's carefully prepared painting environment has been moved without his consent. We don't know how he feels and we don't know how he responded. For me, the situation feels like one well, I'd be a bit annoyed, um, and it's a good a good time to express a bit of annoyance because that's sure as how I'd be feeling. So I'd say, I think I think if I was feeling that I'd be okay, whatever I did in terms of it was okay for me to express some annoyance. I think my adaptive response would be that I'd be a bit upset too. So I'd probably um, have some feelings of anger or annoyance, and I'd have a a behavioural response which would be an expression of anger to the group. So I'd say. Uh, being comfortable defining boundaries you could say guys that's really annoying that you move my stuff please can you tell me if you're going to have lunch in here next time or whatever uh, because they moved your stuff without the consent so because this situation is so obviously calling for a, a, resp a kind of for being that you would be irritated here it looks like if people are taking maladaptive behaviors in their dream uh, that he probably will not express any anger given going on he must not express this kind of reaction so I'm going to predict the maladaptive response is is not expressing any anger. So I think he's going to feel some bit annoyance and anger, which because this is a situation that would cause you to be upset. But I think he'll also feel some tension around the expression of, of this anger. And I think that he will stand there silently and not express the anger to the group. And when I probed further with Andrew, that's exactly what his response was. Um, is another example for prediction. Laura has been asked to attend a meeting uh, high up on the floor of an office building. She arrives on time and gets into the lift. She discovers that the lift has no buttons and will not move. Um, so she has been asked to attend an office, a meeting in an office building. She gets there on time, which is good from her point of view. The lift has no buttons and she can't get there. So if we just imagine the adaptive response here, and imagine this happening to us in real life, we've done everything right. We've turned up on time to this meeting and whoever's organized this meeting in this tall building has chosen to organize it in a tall building with a lift, with no buttons, which means that we can't actually get there. So it's it's really not our fault. We've done everything right, and they've actually done something which is a bit annoying because uh, you've obviously traveled to the meeting. So you might be a bit stressed because you want to get to the meeting, but it's also their fault too. So I'd probably be a little bit miffed, and maybe I would uh, I'd feel some frustration and um, and some, some mild stress. But again, this isn't my fault, so I'm not going to be too stressed. 
and I'm going to sit in the lobby maybe or I'd walk up the stairs or I'd try and call them. Um, so if if I think that this kind of slightly calm, maybe slightly annoyed reaction is adaptive, I think that um, Thora is going to have a much more stressed reaction that for some reason she feels that this is her fault, even though she's done the right thing by turning on, up on time. Uh, and she's going to feel in some way responsible for this. So I think she's going to be very stressed and uh, and feel guilty and have a behavioral response of panic. And that's, again, that's exactly what her behavioral uh, response was in the dream and her feelings in the dream. So this could be a case of she must never um, upset other people or she mustn't allow other people to be upset. Uh, so somehow she's feeling she's taking responsibility for stuff which isn't really her responsibility. Uh, here's another example of prediction. Um, as part of a reduction of a prescription medication dependency, which this person, Daniel, was, was actually experiencing in real life, Daniel is taking some Valium. Daniel's father presents him with a dangerously large amount of Valium to take uh, and a glass of water. He wants him to swallow all of the pills at once. Daniel wakes up. So again, we have the situation that someone's asked Daniel to take a lot of Valium um, and swallow all of the pills at once. And that's a pretty clear situation. If someone asked you to take a dangerous amount of drugs, which you knew were dangerous, you'd probably say no to that. Um, and so I'm saying the adaptive response is saying no. So you'd say, you'd feel like, hey, this is dangerous. I don't want to take this. And you'd say, I'm not going to take these, these pills. Uh, and I think that, therefore, if he's taking the maladaptive response to in the dream, he's going to be, he's going to still feel like this is a little bit silly. I don't want to take these pills. But I think he's going to, He's going to take the pills, so he's going to feel that this is dangerous, but he has to swallow them, and he's reluctantly going to swallow the pills. And again, that's exactly what uh, Daniel did in, in this dream. Uh, again, this looks like a case where he very clearly should say no, but for some reason he's not saying no, so perhaps he feels like he should not kind of define these boundaries, he should not express this barrier. And this is an, uh, a kind of, I think, a bit of fun, but this is an example um, where... I don't actually know what the outcome is of this prediction. Um, so this is from an article in The Guardian recently, which is called uh, Night Terrors, What Do Anxiety Dreams, Dreams Mean? And um, during the exam, a student raised their hand for paper and was given sliced bread. Uh, so again, let's imagine that we're in this situation. We're studied for an Im important exam. Uh, and this, this, in this article, they talk about all the students who were having an exam at the time. That's why they were dreaming about the exam. Uh, so imagine that you were in, in uh, an exam that you cared about and you raised your hand for paper and you were given a sliced bread. It's a really good time to say, hey, uh, can I have some paper, please, instead of some bread so I can finish my exam? <laughs> so I think the adaptive response would be to match that sentiment. So to say, um, to be a bit confused, a bit frustrated and angry to feel that way and then to demand some paper to use that would be a really sensible thing to do if you were actually in an exam and someone handed you some sliced bread instead of paper to um to complete your test on and i think that because the person takes typically take maladaptive responses in their dreams that this person is going to feel confused uh, and angry but also maybe a little bit stressed um, and they're going to feel stressed but they're going to sit there and they're not going to demand any paper, they're just going to sit there with their bread and feel stressed out. And I don't know the, out, the outcome of this one. Um, so perhaps if the person who's who's written the article re watches this, they can they can answer that. So how do dreams achieve this? Um, so to understand that, we're going to look at mind wandering, um, which is kind of when your brain starts to imagine things uh, and your behavior while you're awake. And again, mind wandering, uh, the mind wandering network. Again, this guy William Domhoff, this term mind wandering uh, and kind of the imagination network really comes up in his works work a lot. So he says that dreaming is an enhanced and enriched form of mind wandering. And he quotes another paper where which says dreaming amplifies the same features that distinguish mind wandering from goal oriented goal directed thought. So mind wandering and dreams really go hand in hand in terms of the areas of the brain which are activated. So when we are awake, uh, we're gonna we're gonna kind of graph some some behaviors uh, and and situations. So a situation and a behavior like we've been looking at previously. So for example, complaining about cold food, standing in line for a safe roller coaster. So staying in line for a roller coaster. You're at Disneyland. It's got a big loop de loop, 
um, so you're a little bit freaked, but uh, you know it's going to be safe. Or let's say you have OCD and you have a reaction to ketchup, you think that ketchup contaminates you, uh, and not washing your hands after holding a bottle of ketchup. Um, so these are all adaptive uh, behaviours. Um, so, for example, when you get cold food, uh, it's quite good to complain about it. Staying in line for a roller coaster, which is safe, is, is good. Uh, and not washing your hands if you have OCD is also good because it's it, you can really damage your, your, even your skin by how much you wash your hands. So we can see on the left that, that these behaviours are adaptive. Uh, and it's also possible to have maladaptive behaviours in a situation. So it could be the case of not complaining about cold food to be a maladaptive but very safe behaviour. But you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get any warm food. Uh, or leaving the queue uh, when you were in line for a roller coaster is very safe because you're definitely not going to fall out of the loop the loop um, in a roller coaster which you're not on. But if you if you're at Disneyland, you know it's going to be safe. Then then leaving it is a bit boring. And if you have OCD, washing your hands repeatedly after holding a bottle of ketchup is very safe because you're imagining that they're contaminated. But it's actually not very good for you, and so it's maladaptive. Um, so what happens when we're awake and we have mind wandering? We typically try to take adaptive behaviors. Um, so you might want to get on that roller coaster or you might want to complain about the food or you might want to not wash your hands. But our, for some reason, we're kind of pushed towards taking very safe maladaptive behaviors. Um, so while we're, while we're trying to maintain this adaptive position, uh, we start to imagine things. and this, we imagine very scary things happening, kind of the worst that could happen. Uh, so if we were in our situation where we were complaining about cold food, we might imagine that the waiter's gonna hate me, my friends are gonna judge me for making a fuss, everyone will shout at me for complaining. Uh, and, that's, and that's gonna make it really hard for us to have this adaptive behavior because we're imagining all these bad things happen, happening to us. So it would be safer if we moved our behavior to a safe position, which, is, which might be safe, but it's maladaptive. Um, we, we, if you have OCD and you have ketchup on your, uh, you, you've held, held some ketchup and you're trying to not wash your hands, you're going to imagine that you are becoming contaminated. And I chose this example because it was from a study that was done. And, uh, one of the quotes was that our patients often reported having imagined visual representations of the contaminants, um, which they had held in their hands. So they imagine themselves kind of being destroyed by or contaminated by these uh, these the stuff they were holding and it's a bit like dreaming kind of visually imagining um, something happening and some of the similar areas of the brain uh, light up with with people with OCD who visualize things uh, as, as dreaming so we can see that these imagination these um, the things that we imagine really uh, we imagine these scary things happening and it pushes our behavior to walk from being adaptive but a bit risky down here to being maladaptive and very very safe up here. So, for to not complain about the cold food, to leave the line, the roller coaster if you're imagining yourself falling out, and to wash your hands repeatedly uh, if you have if you've held ketchup and you have OCD. Uh, so this is all happening while we're awake. So, mind wandering while we're awake pushes us towards making make, taking maladaptive. Uh, anxious or rather very very safe behaviors so now we're going to look at dreaming and how it highlights maladaptive behavior so in dreaming uh, we're taking maladaptive behaviors as we as we've discussed and the situation around us what we're imagining is making it look really really weird that we're taking these maladaptive behaviors uh, so for example we have seen um, a situation which is calling for an adaptive behavior, for example, a smelly homeless person asking you to get into a dangerous bed. But we've seen someone take this, that's a really good thing to say no to, but we've seen someone uh, get into the bed instead. So they're taking a very maladaptive behavior, even though they're imagining a situation which really calls for an adaptive behavior. Uh, or we've seen Andrew, for example, uh, whose canvas had been moved without his permission, and we've seen him express no anger. So that situation really calls for some adaptive anger, but actually he's he's not expressing any of of of, uh, of that. So he's taking a maladaptive behavior, even though the situation he's imagined while dreaming um, is uh, is is um, is calling for 
an adaptive response. So we have these two differences um, between uh, awake and, uh, and dreaming. That when we're awake, we're imagining the worst. So we're moving from an adaptive position to a maladaptive but very safe position. And when we're dreaming, we're kind of imagining situations which demand the best of us. So we're, in a, we're doing maladaptive behavior, but the situation seems to call for adaptive behavior. So we've looked before at the difference between the neurology of when you are awake and when you're dreaming. Um, and that we've seen already that there's these differences because the executive functions are on when you're awake and they're not on when you're dreaming. But there's actually another difference, which I didn't bring up. And that, that difference is that the amygdala uh, is very active when you're awake and you're having a mind-wandering experience. But when you're dreaming, your amygdala is off. So the amygdala is a bit of the brain which tells you that you're scared. Uh, so this bit of you saying that you're scared is on while you're awake, but when you're dreaming, it's off. Um, so the amygdala is on and it's off here. Um, so that's the first difference that um, you're, you're looks like you're not very scared when you're dreaming. Uh, so your amygdala is on when you're awake and imagining things and it's off when you're asleep and imagining things. And the next one is is to do with a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine or neuroadrenaline. So just in case you don't know what a neurotransmitter is, in your brain you have many many cells uh, and these brain cells connect to each other with a very small gap in between them and in this gap uh, chemicals flow in between and you can see here this this little red little dots going in between are the, are the neurotransmitters and norepinephrine is a type of neurotransmitter and different types um, surface when you're in different situations and communicate different things to different neurons it's like a, a kind of communication system within the brain and norepinephrine, uh, these, it, it, it massively increases when you're stressed in real life. So if you're calm, it's kind of at a reasonably, it's at a certain level, but it's not particularly high. And then when you're stressed, it rapidly goes up and then say the stress is resolved, it comes down. But when you're dreaming, it falls by 85%. So uh, instead, it's the opposite of being stressed. Again, your your mind is is gone from having the amygdala on with a high amount of norepinephrine when you're having mind wandering when you're awake to the amygdala being off and having a low level of norepinephrine uh, when you're dreaming. So when we're awake, we're having anxious mind wandering where we imagine the worst, uh, which means we can, we can have, uh, we're, we're, we're forced to take maladaptive but very safe behaviors. And in dreaming, we're having secure or calm mind wandering. Uh, where the the situation that we're imagining uh, is encouraging us to take uh, more adaptive behaviors. So dreams um, let us become aware of maladaptive beliefs through observing um, an, us in an exaggerated situation which demands adaptive behavior um, and us looking at only the emotional behavior. So we're getting to see someone act in a situation which calls for an adaptive behavior. We're seeing them act act out in a very emotional way that they are, they have a maladaptive belief present in their emotions. Uh, and this is achieved through secure mind wandering, um, where the mind wandering network is on, the amygdala is off and norepinephrine is low. I just want to quickly look at one potential implication of this theory. Um, so if it is the case, and obviously it, it is nowhere near proven, this is what dreams are. Um, but if it is the case that dreams help allow us to become aware of maladaptive beliefs through observing us ourselves in situations that are exaggerated and looking at just the emotional behavior. Uh, then awareness, this idea that somehow other people will view our actions or that we can our actions can be viewed because you see that a big part of this is looking at the someone's behavior in a situation. This this idea of awareness is and and, and that our behavior will be observed is very deep down within us, that deep down we understand our behavior will be observed. But right now, we're not observing behaviors in this really safe way through dreams. Instead, we're only observing behaviors in the real world, because right now, as a society, we're ignoring dreams. Um, and it means that if you do have a maladaptive belief, which perhaps is visible in a dream, you might have to start, to, which right now we're not looking at, you might have to start to take real world actions that are more severe for everyone to become aware of that maladaptive belief. 
and it as dreaming is also an internal process um it, it looks like we really want these maladaptive beliefs to be spotted by other people so perhaps we have to when it comes to mental health symptoms have to become severe um because the more severe symptoms become the greater the likelihood that someone will observe our weird behaviors and allow us to remove the maladaptive belief in the way that we've discussed so far so perhaps if we looked a little bit earlier for maladaptive beliefs um we wouldn't have to have so many people with severe uh, mental health symptoms uh, thank you very much for watching um and uh goodbye